We are so used to the mega structures of the 21st century, to the skyscrapers of dozens of levels, to impressive works of engineering, and yet, sometimes just walking into a building that was built 2,000 years ago can make our jaws drop. For that's what the Pantheon does. The most famous, the most iconic, the most important of all Roman temples is the Pantheon. It has that huge inscription on the frieze, that empty pediment, that perfectly ordinary colonnade on the front. And that shape, characteristic of all Roman temples. That is the first thing you notice about the building, and it was the first thing that the ancient Romans also noticed. Which made them believe that when they entered, they were entering a conventional temple, like the other temples in their city. But once they walked through the enormous bronze doors, they were amazed. The exterior of the building was designed to prepare you for something as different as possible from the interior. And when you came in, you entered a space that was simply overwhelming. In the front we have 16 huge columns all made of one piece, something quite unusual since they were generally made of several pieces. These were granite brought from Egypt, they were necessary to support the enormous weight of the pediment of this temple. The double pediment is due to the fact that the columns were originally going to be taller but they had problems transporting them, and so they put the current ones 44 Roman feet high. The reconstruction that we have of the image in the pediment is generally that of a crowned eagle, that was a sacred symbol for the Romans. The eagle associated with the god Jupiter and the crown with the deified emperors. So this is no coincidence. If we get a little closer we can see how massive these columns are and the space of the portico, which by itself could be a temple. On the ceiling we see this wooden structure with beams and marble arches. When reading all the descriptions of this work, we discovered that the wooden structure was originally made of solid bronze. In the 17th century, it was replaced with wood to use the bronze to make the baldachin for St. Peter's Basilica. To understand the shape of the Pantheon, we must know that it takes two different types of temples and transforms them. Looking at the plan of the Pantheon, you can realize how much you can manipulate the thickness of the wall. All these small subtracted spaces are niches in the wall that make it possible to have altars and statues. And this is necessary because the architectural program of the Pantheon is different from that of most temples. In Greek, Pan means everything, and Theon means God. That is to say, Pantheon, all the gods. So if a typical temple needs to have an altar for a god, the Pantheon, the temple of all gods, needs to have many altars. Or at least it needs to somehow symbolize this connection with the cosmos in a more inclusive way than a typical temple. And it does this in a number of ways. Firstly, it is important to talk about these niches. When we talk about vaults, we talk about these arches that push the loads to the sides, and that is why they require a thick wall to contain the weight. The Pantheon complies with this because it is a very thick wall. But what happens when you start carving these niches inside the wall? Doesn't it undermine the solidity of the wall? In their desire to create spaces for the altars of the gods, are they compromising the stability of their structure? What it does is it crenellates the surface, something similar to what corrugated cardboard does. Corrugated cardboard is very rigid because the curvature of its surface makes it self-bracing. The curvature of its geometry becomes part of the structure. Stone columns are not that useful here because if you push a column, it fails. Arches are much more stable because they distribute the loads to the sides. So by cutting arch-shaped niches, it becomes a sort of corrugation. And even inside the wall, where we cannot even see, they also left cavities to take advantage of this notion that certain geometries can improve the rigidity of the structure. So the Pantheon is a sort of hybrid, and if you compare it to something like the Temple of Fortuna Virilis, you can see how it can be hybrid. Fortuna Virilis is all about one thing. You can see the cella surrounded by a wall and the columns that create a portico, and it's frontal, so how does the Pantheon have these forms? Well, it has a portico and it has a cella, but it is putting together two very different conditions and it brings them together in a way that it doesn't even try to hide. What's more, it's putting together three different conditions. Here's the front of the building. It is the same as the Temple of Fortuna Virilis, only bigger. 
Here's a large rectangular block, that is, this great mass of material that is put to allow these two irreconcilable geometries to be together. And then you go inside and you have this giant space with a dome. When you think about the Pantheon, or any building for that matter, and you try to do an analysis of a building, try to look for the strangest parts. Your analysis becomes better when you focus on these parts. If you were doing an essay on the Pantheon and you said, it's all about a circle, that's boring. You wouldn't have observed deep enough. But something about the union of these three elements, the temple, the huge block of stone, and the cylinder, it becomes very interesting. Pantheon, the temple of all gods. This is the urban planning diagram of the Romans. And when you see the dome of the Pantheon, it seems as though you're seeing this image represented. And this has a double meaning. In plan, we have the circle, but we also have the circle in section. The space of the Pantheon is a spherical, and in the upper part we have an oculus, which means eye. The oculus is inspiring. It is the only light that enters the Pantheon in addition to the one that enters through the door. It rains through it, and the water evaporates through it. But it is one of the characteristics that the Pantheon has, that experience of connection with nature. And you might say, how is it possible to put a hole in the center of the dome? Wouldn't this destabilize the structure of the dome? But the logic of building a dome, and you can see these kind of steps here, it has to do with the stacking and compression of rings. It's like building an arch but sideways, so each of these compressing rings of stone becomes self-stabilizing. They lock together, gravity holds them together, and you can see more or less how they work, because they are much thicker in the part where the dome begins, and as they get closer to the oculus, everything becomes thinner. And if the architects have wanted to continue building, they probably could have, but it was not necessary because it stabilizes that way, and the oculus is a source of light. The idea that it is a circle, or rather that it is a spherical space, is full of meaning. Because the Romans took a lot from the culture and philosophy of ancient Greeks, and this is probably why Romans were so successful in the conquest of foreign lands. Because they gave people fresh water, bridges and roads, and because they allowed the cultures to continue their own traditions, and they took the best aspects of those traditions. And with the Greeks they took a lot of their architecture and their philosophy. In the cosmology of the Greeks described by Plato in one of his books called Timaeus, the cosmos are spherical, the heavens are spherical. Different geometrical shapes adhere very closely to different important elements. Earth is rectilinear, it is a square, the cosmos are a circle. And putting these two irreconcilable geometries together makes visible the reconciliation of the earth with the heavens in a certain way. And when you're inside this space, looking up at the great circle of light that comes from the oculus, this notion of connection with the heavens becomes subjectively something you can experience. It is as if there were another axis introduced into space. Not only the x-axis or the y-axis, but a vertical axis, an axis towards the sky which is called axis mundi, the axis of the world. And this obsession with circles and squares is not only in the volume of the space, but also in the pavement, in the coffers of the ceiling, and in the marble of the walls. The elaboration and articulation of the dome of the Pantheon seems to be cheating in terms of its thickness and of its presence of material. You would think that you might want to have this as thick as possible, because then it would be more solid. But in reality, what you want is to have the least weight possible, because that way, the load of the weight is less for the walls. So one of the design tasks is to reduce the weight of the dome. And to reduce the weight without reducing its rigidity, the coffers are made. Geometries that, just like corrugated cardboard, stiffen the structure. And as the dome becomes thinner and lighter as the coffers go up, the coffers also get smaller. And this gives the illusion that the dome is even higher than it really is. Because this element that you think is only one size continues to reappear and diminish in size like perspective. So it's a very smart building. What made this building possible was of course the use of concrete that was invented by the Romans. And not only that, but also the use of many types and many diverse mixtures of this concrete. The engineering was brilliant, making the weight of the concrete itself lessen as the height rises based on the aggregate. The bronze doors are original from the Roman period. They are large and they allow us to begin to see the interior polychromy of the Pantheon. And from the moment we enter, we can already perceive the volume and the space of the Pantheon. You immediately realize that the building is not static at all, but dynamic. It is full of movement. Especially because everything that lines up in the walls, that is the niches, the columns, the windows, does not line up at all with the coffers on the dome. This creates the feeling that the dome is a completely independent element from the barrel on which it rests. Most of the interior marble is original, as are the approximately 10 meter high columns. 
Each one of the niches had a statue of a god, and that large niche at the end is where the Emperor Hadrian would have received people. So, in addition to a divine temple, the Pantheon had public meetings in which the Emperor spoke with people. When entering the Pantheon, you will always find the light of the Oculus hitting a different spot. But during the year, there are key dates in which you will find the sunlight hitting certain specific parts. For example, on the longest day of the year, the Oculus will be projected exactly in the center of the floor. There are also other dates, such as April 21st, the anniversary of Rome. The door of the Pantheon is the one that receives the projection of the Oculus, so you receive it when you enter. Here's an example of the light hitting on the longest day of the year, June 21st, where you can see the intensity of the light hitting the pavement while the rest is dark. A unique experience that you can see some days of the year. You can have a great appreciation of colors that tell something. Purple was the color of royalty because it was the most expensive pigment, and it reaffirms the divine status of the emperor. In the dome we can see the coffers, which are actually covered with modern stucco, but under the stucco there are holes in the center of each coffer that indicate that each one had a roof set, or a bronze panel, it is not known exactly. It is incredible to think that the interior ornamentation of the Pantheon is only a fraction of what it was in ancient times. On each side of the access door there is a large niche. Agrippa, the original architect, wanted to put inside a statue of the current emperor, Augustus. But Augustus did not feel worthy to be inside, so Agrippa decides to put a statue of himself and one of Augustus in the exterior niches of the temple. And this makes sense, because if you turn to the opposite side of the Pantheon, 800 meters north, you would be seeing the entrance to the mausoleum of Augustus, where he would be buried. This is the inscription that recognizes the original architect, Marcus Agrippa Luci Filius Consul Tertium Fecit. Marcus Agrippa, son of Lucius, made this during his third consul. Actually, the Pantheon of Agrippa burned down twice, and the one we know today was built by the Emperor Hadrian in the year 125. This is a model of how the Pantheon would have been in Roman times. There would be a square in the front and in the back it would have been packed very tightly, because a characteristic of Roman urban space is a figure of void. In ancient Greece, the buildings were the figures in space, while in Rome, it's all about the space that the buildings form. So, even when you have something like a cylindrical building that screams about its figurality, you think that it must be completely impossible not to see a building like this when walking through the city. The fact is that it was packed in tight, and the things that you clearly experienced as shapes were the voids, that is, the squares, the courtyards, the forms in front of the buildings. This is Roman space. On the day of Pentecost, it is a Roman tradition to throw rose petals through the oculus of the Pantheon, a visually extraordinary experience. In the year 608, Emperor Phocas declared the Roman Pantheon as a Christian church, and since then, it has been the most visited site in Italy. The Pantheon was copied in the Renaissance and the Baroque, and in almost every neoclassical building. The Pantheon is perhaps the most influential building in history, both Renaissance and modern. If you think of all the modern architects who take this building as a reference, you will realize that the influence of the Pantheon is about everywhere. Thanks everybody for watching the video until the end, I hope you enjoyed it, I hope you learned something, and if you want me to keep translating my videos into English, uh, like this video and definitely let me know in the comment section below. Also, don't forget to follow me on Facebook and Instagram, and uh, yeah, thanks for watching, goodbye.